Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, we're joined by Rita Gunther McGrath. Rita is a globally recognized expert on strategy, innovation, and growth with an emphasis on corporate entrepreneurship. Uh, Rita, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. And yourself? I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Rita, fill in the gaps. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself personally um, and your journey to where we are today. Uh, Well, I'm a professor at Columbia Business School. Uh, In a previous life, I was an IT director. I uh, ran uh, procurement operations in information technology for the city of New York, (laughs) of all things. Wow. I did my PhD at the Wharton School. And, uh, you know, I think the most kind of interesting thing that's happened in the profession that I work in, which is um, I'm I'm a strategy professor, but my focus has always been on innovation. And when I first started in this field, strategy was sort of in one corner of the room and innovation was in the other one. And the cool kids were all doing strategy. They were doing industry sector analysis and working with the profit impact of market studies database and and doing a lot of very numerical industry-based work. And those of us doing innovation were huddled in a corner for warmth. I mean, it was just, it was a very isolating kind of thing. And in the intervening couple of decades, those two fields have really come together in a very interesting way. So today you really can't talk about strategy without talking about innovation. And you really can't talk about innovation, I don't think, without it being very the strategy. So that's probably one of the more interesting changes that I've seen. Yeah, amazing. And so, so, so where you are now then, what would you say is your area of expertise? Well, it's really at that intersection between strategy and innovation. Mm-hmm. And, so, and what's one, one thing around sort of innovation that HR leaders um, aren't doing or perhaps they should pay more attention to? Well, I think the HR implications of innovation are really important and very poorly understood. So let's say that you've decided you want to be an innovative company. So that implies you're going to be working on it innovative projects, right? And we know innovative projects are uncertain. And with uncertainty comes the tendency that they will fail, you know, the the, the likelihood. So if you want two great projects at the end, you've got to start 10. And best practice would say you put your best people, you know, your most talented, most high potential people on these innovative projects. Uh, Well, if eight of them are going to fail, what do you do with those people? Um, And, you know, in the past, I think that really wasn't recognized as a serious challenge for firms that want to innovate at scale. And as a consequence, the HR leaders really didn't take this on in terms of, okay, I've got this fantastic person. The project didn't work out through no fault of their own, you know, things that yeah. are uncertain. With them. So where do you take them next? Do you, do you find them another project? Do you move them into a line role? Do you say, wow, you know, they may have not worked out in a business sense, but boy, they've learned so much. You know, how do you, how do you know, do something constructive? Because the, the critical problem is if you don't have a really great way of dealing with that, people very quickly get the message, innovation is no place for a high potential person to spend their career, and you'll never get people who are talented to volunteer to innovate again. So mm-hmm. to me, if, if HR leaders could crack that, that would be a, a super advantage for them. Yeah. So what, what, what are some of the steps then you would, you'd recommend to help us go in that direction? Because I suppose it's a, big, it's a big shift in culture as well, right? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think firstly, you need to understand that that's likely and prepare the organization for it. Uh, secondly, I think you need to have a very honest, uh, almost recruitment strategy for these folks. So when they sign on to something that's innovative, they need to be, they need to be aware that it, it may not work out. Now, here's the dichotomy, right? You need them pursuing this thing with as much passion and as much commitment as they possibly can. So they can't be waking up every morning thinking, oh my God, this is yeah. not <laughs> may not work out. It's not the best motivation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but, but at the same time, if it doesn't work out, they need to be prepared to be moved to the next thing. So I think you need to have an actual plan to do that. So, you know, in your personnel reviews, whatever, you need to give people credit and they need to be, you know, look, it's almost like um, the best practice to me would be you don't get to advance in the corporation until you presided over something that hasn't worked out. So it becomes, instead of this, oh my God, it didn't work out, this is a disaster for my family. Yeah. It becomes, wow, I have to have my first failure or I can't move ahead. Yeah, that's, I think that's a big shift in mindset though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for, for many people, not just the people, but also the organization in, because in, everyone's always expecting the result, right? Whereas, 
I think you have to fail many. I think many organizations that are successful are the ones that fail the most in order to achieve those great breakthroughs, in order to achieve that, that innovation within their businesses. But unfortunately, most people build organizations the opposite way around, where sort of risk averse <laughs> and trying to make sure we get it right every single time. Um, are there organizations that you've seen out there that are doing this successfully? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, um, can you just see? Uh, well, I think some of the organizations that have really moved up what I call the innovation maturity scale have yeah. got a, you know, a really great way of, of dealing with these things. I mean, Amazon would obviously be the poster sure. child. They, they try a lot of stuff. They fail a lot. They, they, they do things that are different. Um, and I think they have a very clever way of dealing with projects that don't work out. They really do move people through these projects very quickly. Um, so that would be an example of a company that yeah. isn't afraid to try things and fail. It's funny if you, um, you know, if you ever Google, you know, Amazon failures, or I did do this actually, uh, product failures, or I did one with Virgin. Um, and you never remember the failures, do you? No one ever yeah. remembers the failures. Uh, I saw, you know, Virgin Cosmetics, you know, Virgin Clothing, Virgin, they had their own version of sort of Apple, the, the first sort of iTunes and all of these different things. And you never remember, no one ever remembers the failures. They, they, they pumped in millions of pounds and resources into these. And mm -hmm. Amazon's obviously known for that as well. They're never afraid <laughs> to, yeah. go, to go into a new area. And um, I think the businesses that are willing to do that are the ones that are going to win um, mm -hmm. as well. So how can we use the HR as a competitive advantage then? Well, I think um, what we're moving toward is a world in which, uh, as Reid Hoffman very famously said, people are being involved in tours of duty. And what that means is that instead of thinking of a career ladder where you, know, you start at a level 14 and you know, your goal is to get to level two, um, you're really saying, okay, well, I may, I may start somewhere and I may do that for 18 months or a year or two. Um, and then I'm going to renegotiate what the next step is. And there's been some fascinating research on this done by, um, I think it was Corn Ferry, working with LinkedIn. And what they looked at was who, what kind of career structure is likely to lead people to get to the C-suite, to get to that really senior level. And what they found was that it's not these linear career tracks where you're deeply in one um, function, that instead what it is is much more of a zigzag. So you may take a few lateral moves, you may go from say marketing to operations um, because that broadens your view, right? And so by the time you get to the leadership level, senior leadership level, you've had these experiences which have taught you to look at things in a much broader way than historically you would have if you'd just been moving along one direction. So I think one of the implications for HR is, you know, first of all, who's 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 coaching this you know if you think about a, sure. a, a soccer team or something you know who's actually seeing where the players are on the field and who's doing what um and then where where are you finding your most valuable talent um another big thing i think that hasn't changed yet but will is our screening for talent um right now i would say it's incredibly clumsy um you know, we use all these um, proxies for skill right now. So where did you go? Where did you get your degree? Um, what are your credentials? What tests have you passed and so forth? Um, and those things are really proxies. So in the United States, for example, we use a lot of, a lot of entry level jobs have a requirement for a bachelor's degree. And what we don't realize is that if you use that as a requirement for any kind of a job, it automatically screens at 80% of all um, Latino applicants and 83% of all potential African American applicants. Um, and it's not that they haven't been educated, it's that they just don't have the completion because life gets in the way. Right, so they don't have the credential, but they have a lot of what you need. And so I think one of the things HR is going to have to start getting really smart about is let's um, let's screen people on the basis of some kind of skill that's relevant to the role we're trying to get them to play, rather than some credential that just basically means I showed up for four years and yeah. I handed in my papers and my professors thought I was okay, you know, and I brushed my teeth in the morning and you know, I mean, it's like it's got nothing to do with. What <laughs> well, I can tell you from my personal experience speaking with the leaders of you know, my tech that that's rat rap sorry rapidly changing yeah. many of the chros i'm speaking to have gotten rid of that having the requirement of right. of, a, of, a, of of that of that on the on the and also even completely getting rid of job specs 
mm-hmm. in general, which are very generic and one dimensional. You know, it, and how often does a job spec actually reflect the role anyway? <laughs> it, exactly. I know from the job specs I've had in the past that when I jumped into that managerial role or that business, it was nothing like what was on a job spec. And um, and in it, within that as well, you don't you never talk about it. Doesn't really look at attitude as well or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, for me, when I was hiring, I was always looking for attitude first. You know, are they competitive? Uh, you know, in terms of the sales requirements that I was looking for, uh, rather than a job spec of how long have you been, what university did you go to, how long have you been in sales, etc. So, I think that's that's certainly changing now. It's slowly, <laughs> but surely it's changing. And me personally, when I when I got my first job. Um, that was on the that was on the um, the job description that you needed to to have a have a degree, and uh, my answer to in the interview of when they said Chris you don't have a degree and I said well what does that matter because I was very young and naive I was seventeen I said why does that matter to have a sales job that I have a degree it has nothing to do with learning how to sell and they kind of just were stumped in the interview the, the, man, the HR manager looked towards the sales director and I, and they, and, and it, they realized it was right and and then I, I got the job. Uh, and I was there for 10 years so, and, and I was one of the most successful people in the organization but as you said 80% of people would never even have made it to that so right. completely agree with you that's huge that's and the amount of talent I can only imagine the organizations are missing out on oh, uh, totally. the, other, the other big the other big I think thing that is starting to be mission critical for HR directors is the whole diversity agenda yeah and you know what what at Columbia, um, at Columbia University, I, I manage a three-day program called Women in Leadership. Uh, and it's really about this emerging consensus of what we have to do differently in order to uh, advance women's careers. And some of it, you know, some of it's very subtle and difficult, and but, but some of it is just so easy. I mean, just low hanging fruit stuff. So things like instituting the no interruption rule in meetings. Um, things like having uh, blind uh, initial screenings of resumes where you don't know the gender of the person. Things like establishing the criteria for a job before you uh, look at individual candidate specifications. I mean, this is not expensive. This is not difficult. This is a no-brainer kind of thing. And, you know, if organizations would just do some of that, we'd be much more advanced in being able to advance the diversity agenda. And this isn't just about women. It's also about talent of all kinds. Um, and so I think, you know, HR leaders could implement those things tomorrow with zero cost. Mm. What are your thoughts? So why would you not do that? Why would, no, why? No. I, I, ask, I ask myself these questions every day. After every podcast, I'm sitting there going, why? <laughs> and a lot of times, as you said, there isn't, it's not, they're not very costly or even in, in a lot of cases, even time, time um, yeah. doesn't take a lot of time either. Um, you do, you do you ask yourself that. Meeting that, that, you know, you're not allowed to interrupt or talk over each other. How hard is that? It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we've been talking about recently, you just sort of touched upon it is the link between innovation and diversity um, and, and how uh, tapping into those diverse, um, sort of the diverse cultures and, and um, that exist in your business can help you innovate. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you, have you come across anything, any, any outcomes there that you could share? Or any, oh, there's, there's a ton of research which shows that diverse teams are more creative and innovative. And there are a, a number of reasons for that. Um, the first is obvious, obvious, you know, you, you, if you have a diverse team, you've got a broader range of human experience to choose from. You know, so that, that's obvious. The second one, though, is interestingly, having to negotiate diversity actually ignites a part of your brain that doesn't normally get touched. So if we're in a homogenous team, we're all fine. We understand each other. That's good. We all get along. Um, and the brain kind of looks around and goes, oh, no threat. We'll, we'll just sleep here. <laughs> Whereas yeah. this, this sort of primordial part of your brain that gets woken up and says, wait a minute, this is, this is different. I have to start paying attention. And so we're active, actually more alert and more present when we have to negotiate with someone who's coming at things from a, quite a different perspective than we are. Now, the ironic thing about this is it feels worse. It feels harder. And so one of the interesting findings from the research on this is that homogenous teams perform more poorly, but they feel better about it. Oh, Diverse really? Teams perform better, <laughs> but they feel worse. It's like, oh they're my pushing God, themselves. It's uncomfortable because yeah. it's not normal. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It's so hard. <laughs> we had this big debate. We, we just kept talking. <laughs> 
past each other. It was like, we really had to work hard to get to a consensus. And yet it's that effort that often leads to a much better result. One other thing that I think is important for your audience to remember is that there's a lot of research which shows that if you are successful at promoting diversity, everybody's performance goes up. So the men's performance goes up if you're really doing well by your women. It, the whole team gets gets elevated. And I think that's something we don't pay to enough. And you know, a lot of times these um, these diversity or, or gender debates get couched in terms of win-lose. You know, if the women are advanced, the men must be yeah. What the research shows is that's not true. It's actually one of the few cases in business where doing the right thing leads both sides to winning. Why, why is that? Um, part of it is because the, um, the very factors that tend to hold women back also keep men from expressing their ideas and, oh, okay. and bringing their own best selves to situations. There's, a, there's a, a, a factor called psychological safety. And it turns out that teams that are very good at being inclusive and diverse tend to have much higher levels of psychological safety. So if you're in a meeting, and I'm sure you've been in these, you know, where you feel like anything you say is subject to attack and the whole person. <laughs> yeah, everyone's been there. <laughs> and not to, not to reveal too much, you know, and to be uncontroversial. If that's that kind of meeting, well, everybody holds back. The men hold back, the women hold back. Um, but if you're in the kind of meeting where you say something that might be a little bit out of the ordinary and the leader instead of saying well, why did you say that you know looks at you and says that's a really interesting perspective let's hear more and gives you the space to articulate it um more diverse ideas come into the conversation more open dialogue happens and the performance of everybody rises mm. that's very very interesting i was sitting here just thinking about it while you're talking about about many p past experiences that i've had in that situation um but i've also been in the opposite end of the spectrum where i've been part of teams where as you said everyone's very everyone's completely um, happy and confident to share everything and put everything on the table. And it does feel uncomfortable sometimes, but the best thing, the best uh, results come out of that. Um, mm -hmm. I have a meeting with my team every week where I ask them how we can improve. And um, it is awkward sometimes because obviously I'm, I'm leading the organization. It is uncomfortable because it's obviously directly saying what you're doing, Chris can be improved. But some <laughs> of the best things that we have come out of that meeting. Uh, I didn't do it for that purpose of what you just said, but it just made me think about that. Mm -hmm. it, it is uncomfortable. And everyone, sometimes people don't want to tell me, but they'll tell me anyway. And the best things our business have ever, the best things that we've ever come up with in our organization, including the podcast actually have come from those types of um, uh -huh. those meetings. So yeah. Very... And the feedback, the feedback is essential because, you know, as you, in most organizations, as you start to get more senior, it's just much, much harder to get yeah. into that feedback about what you're doing. And it's impossible to improve if you don't have those feedback loops. There was some interesting research um, looking at intuition and who has the best intuition. And part of that research was uh, done by my colleague, Dan Ames. And he asks, asks his classes, he says, who's the best, what's the best profession at detecting whether people are lying to you? Oh, and, you know, people guess, yeah, and people guess all kinds of things, you know, like, like uh, yeah, police officers or whatever. It turns out the profession that is all time best in the world at telling if someone's lying are customs agents. Oh, because they're seeing thousands and thousands of people, I suppose, every single day. Well, here's the thing. Unlike most of us I mean, you know, in, hum in human life. It's very hard to get feedback, right? I say to my husband, do you think this dress makes me look fat? <laughs> He'll tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> I'm getting an answer to that question. <laughs> no, no way. Whereas a customs agent says, you know, do you, have a, do you have meat in your bag? Do you have a monkey in your bag? Oh, you yeah. Meat? All day, every day. And, yeah. uh, and the person says, no. And they say, well, let's just have a look. And so their intuition gets sharpened over thousands, as you said, of experiences. Mm. Uh, I have a hypothesis. Let me test that hypothesis. And most of us in our careers don't have that opportunity. And so our intuition doesn't get sharpened in that way that feedback can get it sharpened for you. Mm. Interesting. Um, going back to, obviously you've worked with some amazing organizations and leaders. Is there a particular project or, or success story that you could share with us that really stands out to you that you're proud of? I'm okay. sure there are many. Yeah. You personally as a project, oh, um, you know, project you've been part of. Yeah. One of the most interesting and well-documented stories, uh, because just, and, 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 and I was peripherally involved with it, but um, I guess there are two. One is the Lou Gerstner uh, turnaround of IBM back in the 90s. Um, and I got involved with that when they were 
they, they kind of stabilized the organization. I mean, it was in free fall and crisis and Gerstner came in and said, whoa, you know, we have to at least get back to uh, normal operating profits. And then once he felt comfortable that they had done that, then his next mandate was to try to grow the organization. And I got involved with a project called the uh, Emerging Business Opportunity uh, Agenda. And they, um, you know, they, they really were making an effort to do innovation in a radically different way. And what they found was that they needed a different structure to do innovation at scale. And they built this emerging business opportunity platform, which I thought is still, to my experience, one of the best ways of structuring innovation. And this has big implications for HR. So what they would do is they would take a senior leader, typically someone who had a lot of organizational credibility, they would identify what they would call a, a platform for growth. So as an example, one of the ones I worked on back in the day was a thing called pervasive computing. Sounds uh, which, interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe we would think of it as the internet of things, but it was this idea that, wow, you know, if everything was computable in some way, what business would there be for IBM? And they took a guy who had been in charge of IBM's Unix business, a huge business for IBM. So this is, uh, his name is Chad Adkins, and uh, he ran this thing with 30,000 people in it. So they pulled him out of that role and said, okay, your job is to figure out pervasive computing. And what they did was he had a direct relationship to a guy named Bruce Harold, who reported directly to Gerstner. So Harold's sole job <laughs> at the time was to look after the resources and the people dedicated to new business. And so Gerstner's position was, you know, new business resources have to be ring fenced from the needs of the established business. And so what they would do, and this was the genius part, and I think the one that has greatest implications for HR, is as Adkins tried to figure out what this business actually could look like, they would take parts of existing units and fold them under this EBO. Uh, either emerging business opportunity uh, ideas. And so what emerged was this structure that made sense for what the EBO needed to be. Most companies, they'll take innovations, they'll sort of try to force fit them into the structures of existing businesses rather than um, let them emerge in their own way. Uh, it's one of the reasons big companies struggle so hard um, competing against small ones because big companies are trying to do, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to tap dance with, you know, something that was built to do snowboarding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the new company doesn't have that problem, right? And so this was a very clever to me way of overcoming some of those natural organizational tendencies. Um, so that was that was something I was I, I thought really had a huge impact uh, on IBM during the Gerstner era, and I still think of it as one of the great ways of overcoming a lot of the systemic problems of innovation that we see all the time. Amazing. And and, and uh, I think as you what you just said, even though it was quite a while ago, it's so prevalent right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with all, all organizations going through and even in HR uh, I had many of our, our projects we normally get sort of big global brands but over the last year or so I've been getting many emails and phone calls saying Chris can you bring the startups mm -hmm. you know I want to meet with the HR leaders from the, the startups out there you know the companies that don't have the boundaries that I have they don't have the red tape they can move quickly they can innovate quickly you know and they can build these, these, these teams throughout the business and how can we adapt that into our larger organization? So it's completely turned on its head um, from, from the past where anyone just wanted to meet with the other big players. So you can certainly see how that's sort of affecting now. What was the other area you said? You said you had another uh, sort of your two. Oh, one of the other stories that I wasn't, I wasn't personally involved with, but I just think it's a really useful set of lessons is the, there's a book called American Icon. Uh, Alan Mulally and the turnaround of Ford, something like that. Um, but what was interesting was Alan Mulally um, came from Boeing, very gifted leader, uh, came into Ford, which was deeply, deeply troubled at the time. And there was a reporter called Bryce Hoffman who asked if he could be a fly on the wall as this turnaround, you know, unfolded. Um, and Mulally said, sure, you know, watch what we do. And so what, what I think is interesting is the turnaround, first of all, was absolutely fascinating. And the book is, is a very useful and accessible resource for people to follow along almost as a textbook of how you grab hold of an organization and, and transform it. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to definitely have to link that in the description now <laughs> for everyone. Um, what's one thing about what you, the industry now and what you, the work you're doing that most excites you that you're obsessed with? <laughs> um, um, right now I'm working on how do you make innovation at scale systematic? 
Um, so some years, for years now, I've been working on a concept uh, we call discovery-driven growth, which is a set of practices and principles that are disciplined, but the discipline is appropriate for innovation. And it started you know, in 1995 with an article I wrote called Discovery-Driven Planning, which basically said you can't plan for something new the way that you plan for existing businesses. And it goes back to something you and I were talking about in, in terms of failure, right? So if you know something's not gonna work out, what do you do that's different? And so discovery-driven planning has been picked up. It's now you know, been, been a foundational work in the lean startup movement. Um, it's been, people are now realizing we can't do things this old way. And so what I've begun to evolve is, I've actually got a, a small firm now dedicated to really helping companies embed these practices in what they're doing every day. So the company's called Valiz, V-A-L-I-Z-E. And it's meant to sort of in, in, invoke uh, value realized. Um, because one of the things I see a lot is what I call innovation theater. You know, companies will say, oh, you know, we have new stuff around here. And then, and then they have innovation boot camps and everybody goes off and tries to brainstorm and <laughs> idea sessions. Thousands of post-it notes die, you know, a horrible death. Um, and because we don't have the right processes in the organization, it, it just, the effort, you know, sometimes it gets a little stuff going, but most often it peters out. And the reason is you need three elements to your innovation program. You need ideation, getting the idea. Of course, that's important. But you also need incubation, the ability to take an idea and craft it into something that demonstrates product market fit. And once you've got product market fit, you need acceleration. And this is often the hardest thing. And another place where HR leaders can play an enormously important role, which is you've got a fledgling business and you can think of it almost like your main organization is like an eight lane superhighway, right? It's got trucks and cars and everybody's chunking along at 80 miles an hour. Well, your little innovation is a fledgling. It's sitting on the on-ramp and somehow you need to help it become a grown up. And that means you need to bring in HR, you need to bring in legal, you need to bring in clients, uh, compliance, you need to pay off technical debt. So, you know, the funky little systems that you built when you were prototyping, I'm sorry, you know, when you're facing actual customers, you need reliability, you need cybersecurity, you need stability. Um, when you are looking at your people, right? In a startup, in, even inside a big organization, there's a thing called organizational debt. So in the beginning, everybody's doing everything, right? You know, who cares about titles? Who cares about roles? Um, okay, we'll yeah. pay you, you know, whatever, because we want to get you on board. But if you're going to become part of the parent corporation, suddenly, you know, you need organized job titles. You need to know, okay, X, Y, Z is going to be in that pay range. And this person is equivalent to that. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that were with you on your startup part of the journey are not the right people to be with you when your innovation becomes mature. Um, you know, all of a sudden you need to bring in people who get really, really excited about designing your supply chain. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of your, you know, a lot of your, you know, white sheet of paper people with the post-it notes, that, that, that's not what excites them. So you need a different set of skills. It's almost like a phase change. And I don't see HR taking as much leadership as they should in, in large corporations of really being leaders at that process. You know, rec first of all, recognizing it's necessary. And secondly, being leaders. So one of the things Valise um, does is uh, we have something we call an innovation maturity scale, where it's a very simple assessment. It's 23 questions. Uh, you define who in your organization should answer. And based on those answers, uh, which are all done on a web-based, could be mobile, you know, whatever, based on those answers, um, we can kind of tell you where you are. And the scale ranges from one, which is real focus on exploitation all the way through to eight, which is, you know, you're an Amazon or a Google or somebody and innovation sort of how you live. Um, and I think that's a very useful assessment that people can, can do just to get a sense of where we are. And then based on where you are, what Belize can do is help you design a roadmap that sort of says, you know, because what I'm, what I'm constantly astonished by is people that have not studied innovation think it's like this black art, right? It's it's Steve Jobs in his black t-shirt, you know, and then and then you know the, the clouds parted and music played, and now we have the iPhone. Um, and it's not like that. It's it's a very repeatable, very planable, very disciplined process. Except the discipline is not what most of us are taught. So what Belize is really all about is helping you design that roadmap. It's it's 
What's our governance process? How do we fund innovations? How do we deal with the failures? How do we circle, circulate the HR leaders? So if we've got a great startup person, you know, we don't want to reward that person necessarily by running a big part of the organization. That's not what excites them. What excites them is starting the next thing. So how do we recycle them? You know, so there's these very practical, repeatable processes that, you know, once you tap into them, it becomes totally clear. And people are like, of course, that's common sense. And it is, but it's different than running a mainstream organization, which is designed to repeat and repeat and repeat or repeat. Yeah. Well, you see that you see that in startups outside of big corporates all the time, don't you? That many of the founders aren't necessarily the people that are the ones that should be leading the business. Exactly. You see it all the time now, um, in in because yeah. they're the ones that want to be inside to continue to be creative, continuously to be look, working on new projects, and that's where they thrive. You put them in the CEO seat, and all of a sudden they're like, "This is not what I want." <laughs> what they a all... disaster! It's a total, <laughs> many times it's a total disaster. I mean, you know, I love to tell a story of um, an, a habitual entrepreneur, a guy named John Osher, who was the founding genius behind many things, among them a very successful toothbrush product that became known as the Crest Spin Brush. Um, well, this guy has been a serial entrepreneur. He's done startups since he was eight years old. And his first business was uh, uh, an interesting one. So his, it turns out his parents had been taking oil painting classes. And the oil paintings consisted of paintings of nude female models. So basically pictures of naked ladies. And when the oil classes were done, the, you know, the, the paintings went up in the attic and nobody thought anything more about it. But Osher had an epiphany. He said, wow, if I invite my school chums, and I remember he was about eight years old, I can invite my school chums <laughs> look at these pictures and I can charge them for the privilege. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Now you bring a guy like that into a large corporation like Procter & Gamble, which is <laughs> going to come to your Thursday update meeting? Is he going to submit his spreadsheet of, you know, how many senior level to junior level hires do I have? No, he's got zero interest in doing that. And he thinks anybody that does do that is an idiot. So, you know, <laughs> there's a real kind of HR desire in the, in the company to make yeah. sure that you knit those people together with the people who are actually going to keep the wheels on the bus. I think I found that myself um, with my business partner. When we started, um obviously we were both doing a lot of the, basically doing everything as you do a startup and then we slowly realized that you know he would take care of more of the administrative the the finance side the legal side because that was wasn't really where i was strong and uh, whereas in the beginning i was doing that and it was very difficult for me uh, whereas i want to be on the on the phone every day having conversations with our clients i want to be doing podcasts i want to be creating content i want to be building programs and all the things that i get really excited about and i love whereas you know i was doing you know, at the finance at the end of the the day which was for him insanely easy but for me it was like oh my god <laughs> what am I doing and we had to learn that the hard way yeah. um, and, yeah. and I was like okay this is not going to work we need to what, what got us here in the first place then we stick to that because <laughs> that really works as well so very interesting I have a, I have a wonderful colleague called Les McCune uh, who's written a book called predictable success which I like a lot and he talks about two roles that people often don't recognize are absolutely essential in getting through the initial struggle of a startup. He says every startup needs a visionary, uh, you know, and this is the per person like you, you know, produces the content, has the ideas, has that burning yeah. ambition, has that. But they also need what he calls an operator. Yeah, an operator, <laughs> that's our business partner. <laughs> an operator is uh, go through walls, make it happen, get on with the task. And what's fascinating to me about that is those two roles need each other. You know, yeah, like your, really visionary, do. your visionary is the person that comes in with, you know, a notebook every day and it's like, let's try this. Right. And, and if you're a visionary, you come in at nine in the morning and you tell your team, I had this great idea. And by one o'clock, you're wondering, well, wh why haven't you done anything about this? Right. Um, I can <laughs> so relate to that so much. It's so, it's just, it's, it's our team right here. So <laughs> Yeah. Whereas your operator is sort of like, okay, give, you know, give, give me the goal, give me the goalpost, tell me what we need to do, we'll make it happen. But they don't have the inspiration to do the, the, the sort of yeah, thing. very interesting. Would be very cool. But what's fascinating to me is how symbiotic that is. And if you look at most startups, if they don't have those two roles, or if they have, the worst thing of all is if you got two visionaries. You know, there's really only room for one visionary. <laughs> you know, at a time. In That's tough. I've seen that in other organizations too, even close friends of mine that have started business that have both had that same. And, and I'll give you a good example. I went to the Google, I went to a Google startup uh, uh, meeting a few weeks ago and uh, everyone in the room is a startup and they asked, um, 
um, you know, put your hand, it's called hipsters, hackers and hustlers. Of course it would be right. So the hipsters are like the marketing guys, the creatives, the hackers are the coders, the programmers and the hustlers are the business development, the salespeople. And they asked each sort of genre, you had a badge, so, you know, you choose who you are and you had a badge of, of what you fit in. And I, and we realized in about you know a minute or so when they asked everyone to stand up that 99% of the room were the um, sort of uh, hackers mm -hmm. and there was very few creatives and then even less business development people. Mm -hmm. So you think about all of these people in this room are trying to build businesses, but none of them have a, a m m basically 90% of them didn't have a creative element or a, or a business development element. So they had these amazing apps, amazing solutions. Some of the stuff that was showcased, they were incredible, but you could, you, but I walked away thinking many of them are just not going to get off the ground because they don't have someone to drive the sale or someone to drive the creative, everything else that goes into it. So I can completely relate to that. Um, One of well. the most interesting companies that um, I'm actually partnering with is a software development firm, and it's it's a firm, and it's called Robots and Pencils, where the and is an ampersand. Okay. And just as you just as you described, they actually have roles. So the robots are the coders. The yeah. ampersands. Oh, cool. Are the, <laughs> uh, yeah. the ampersands are the glue that keeps it all together. Yeah. And the pencils are the design thinking, human, creative, yeah. you know, designers. <clears throat> and what's fascinating to me is how absolutely clearly they've each identified those roles. So I was literally in a meeting yesterday with them and uh, I showed them some stuff that somebody proposed to me and the, the woman I was meeting with took one look at it and she said, oh God, our pencils would hate that. That's so cool how they've, it's become part of their culture and their language and their being. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. All right. <laughs> They're, they're an amazing, I will. That's, I'm sure everyone will now. <laughs> they're That's... an amazing little company. And what I think is very cool about them and why I'm partnering with them is that they, they have a deep respect for technology, of course. So they've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, and bots, and you, know, you name it. But everything's got to be human. You know, they've got this really deep vein of let's, let's understand that the machinery is there to serve the human. Yeah, amazing. Um, before we move on to the quick fire round, I'd love to, I know you're working on a new book. Can you share it? Give us a, a sneak insight. Oh, sure. <laughs> so the new book is, uh, the, the working title at the moment is uh, Gradually, Then Suddenly, uh, To the Brink and Beyond. And what the main thesis is, is it's about strategic inflection points. And I define a strategic inflection point as something that occurs in your environment that fundamentally changes the constraints your organization operates under. So you know, any business has a particular moment in history when it's born, and there are things that are possible and things that are not. So an, a strategic inflection point changes those constraints. And part of the problem that established organizations face is we internalize those constraints. We come to take them as the law of the land. That's the way things are, right? And when you have an inflection point, those things all change. And so, you know, Think about YouTube, just as an example. I mean, before you had YouTube, if you wanted to get a video to millions of people, um, you'd have you know, to have millions of pounds. <laughs> you had to be Sony or Time. <laughs> yeah, basically. It was millions of dollars of assets you had to have. Once that constraint goes away, now anybody in a garage somewhere can create a YouTube video and get it to your audience of millions of people. And that's made so many things possible. Now, the, I think the optimistic part of the book, and the book is really about how, what they are, um, how you can detect them, and then what do you do about them? Because an inflection point can be great for your business. It could take it to new heights, or it can be damaging for your business. It can absolutely cause it to fail. Um, and the good news, I think, is that most things that manifest themselves as a strategic inflection point have been brewing for a while. Um, and if you're smart and astute about it, you can pick up on those and really leverage the inflection point to your own benefit. Amazing. Thank you much for sharing now. I look forward to, to reading it. <laughs> yeah, <me too. laughs> uh, when's it, when's it out? Cause it, can, you, can you share that or? Well, you know? we're at the proposal stage still. So I think we're okay. about a year to a year and a half away, but, um, I'm actively working on it and doing the research right now. So that's been a Perfect. lot of Oh, I can imagine. Um, well, look, that leads us quite nicely on to the quick fire round where I'm going to ask you five questions and okay. uh, you have no longer than 30 seconds <laughs> to give us some amazing answers. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> What's the number one, what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a leader within your field? The noise. There's, you know, it's very crowded. There's a lot of noise and making your voice heard is hard and I had to learn how to do that. 
fantastic it's a great answer um what's the best piece of business advice that you've ever received uh get feedback yeah um what's one book do you'd recommend and why well my own of course the end of the <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good primer, I think, on why strategy today is different. I think for HR leaders, another book that I can highly recommend is Aaron Meyer's The Culture Map. Uh, it really unpacks a lot of why cross-cultural interactions are so difficult and what to do about them. Oh, hu- hugely important topic for, for HR. So thanks for sharing that as well on your own. Um, could you share one internet resource that you use or uh, more than one if you want that you use to keep up to date with current events and, and make sure you can move with the industry and as, as it evolves? I actually find Twitter to be very helpful for that. Um, it, it taps me into resources I wouldn't normally run across in my email exchanges. And that's one of the things I value about it, which is it, it can alert you to um, different kinds of skill sets and knowledge that, that you wouldn't normally get. So it adds to the diversity, I would say, of my viewpoints on things. Mm-hmm. And I suppose it's very easy to consume, right? Such a oh, yeah, yeah. bite-sized pieces of content that you can just consume. Fantastic. So I have a funny story on that. Um, I was I was voted one of the top 10 business school professors to follow on Twitter. Oh, really? Cool. I was really good about myself for a while. And then I realized that <laughs> was business school professors. <laughs> <laughs> interesting well look, you've been an amazing guest i really appreciate you taking the time to join us and uh, i know our, our, our leads will be a, a lot better off for it so thank, thank you very you. much for sharing your knowledge and experience um okay. give our listeners one part and piece of guidance if there's one piece of guidance that you could give to to other to leaders out there what would that be i would say it, it draws on something andy grove said many years ago he said snow melts from the edges so develop practices that can connect you to what's actually going on in your business, not sitting at corporate headquarters, but out in the field. Fantastic. Look, guys, make sure you head over to hrdealers.com. There you'll find all of the show notes that I I promise I'll put all of them in there. (laughs) We've had quite a few really great resources and books mentioned throughout the show. So I'm really excited to share that with you all. Um, So all the timestamps will will all be there. Thank you again for taking the time to join us. And um, I wish you all the best until we next speak. It's a pleasure.